My name is Katsuya Thornton. I'm a professor in material science and engineering. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor John Allison. Uh, he received his bachelor's from Air Force Academy uh, in um, engineering mechanics uh, and subsequently received a master's from the Ohio State University uh, and PhD from Carnegie Mellon University, both in uh, meteorological engineering. Uh, he spent 27 years at Ford prior to joining us uh, in material science and engineering department uh, at the University of Michigan. Uh, he was the, um, the technical leader, uh, in, a senior technical leader in the research and advanced, uh, advanced engineering organization at, at, at Ford. Uh, he joined our department in 2010. Uh, and I'm going to try to list uh, his accomplishments uh, and recognition, but there, there are too many, so I'm just going to highlight some of them. Uh, it's not an overstatement to call him uh, the father of integrated computational materials engineering. Uh, as uh, it's been mentioned, uh, it constitutes uh, a big part of materi uh, materials genome initiative that uh, encompasses this uh, um, integration of computation and experiments into uh, the two to uh, predict material properties uh, linking to the uh, the um, materials uh, that you you uh, start with and the processing conditions uh, and uh, try to optimize uh, uh, the uh, manufacturing processes as well as uh, materials that you use. Uh, the, if you do uh, um, uh, Google, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, the uh, um, web search, uh, web science search on integrated computational materials engineering, what you will find is the earliest papers uh, authored by uh, uh, John uh, and in, in 2006. Uh, these the, uh, papers describe the successful programs that he led at, the, at Ford, uh, which I'm sure he will talk about today, um, as well as uh, his visions of ICME uh, uh, that, that he, he, he had. Um, the, uh, even though he's an experimentalist, uh, he led efforts to develop advanced computer uh, software to, uh, to, de to development uh, that simulates ma ma manufacturing processes and predict the influence of manufacturing processes on material properties uh, at the, even the uh, component level. The, um, I, I, the uh, output I then used to in, uh, as an input to, to predict performance of these uh, materials, uh, uh, components that are manufactured uh, and how they perform during their service uh, uh, lifetime. Uh, this is the core spirit of ICME uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, he will describe that today. Um, he was instrumental uh, in, uh, in establishing a strong route for ICME and MGI uh, by co-authoring National Academy report on ICME uh, and co-organizing the uh, first World Congress uh, on ICME. He worked with the White House uh, uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, which ultimately led to the uh, establishment of the Material Genome Initi Initiative. Um, John has earned a number of recognitions, including uh, uh, um, uh, being the member of the uh, fellow of the uh, Acad uh, National Academy of Engineering, and he's a uh, fellow of the uh, multiple um, societies, including TMS and uh, ASM. Uh, he's done a lot of service for the uh, for the societies as well, and he, he served as a uh, as the president of the TMS in the past. Um, so what do all this mean to the University of Michigan material science and uh, uh, engineering? Uh, he, John has brought major research programs uh, since he joined uh, our department, um, he, uh, including the PRISM Center, which is a DOE software innovation center, uh, and ONR basic research uh, challenge program. Um, the, um, the, uh, he also played a key role in, uh, as a lead, uh, lead person for the uh, um, IC, uh, ICME in lift program uh, that uh, Alan Tav discussed uh, just earlier. Um, 
Yesterday, Nick introduced Sharon uh, Grotzer as a theorist who can communicate with the experimentalist and how, that, uh, how, how, how important that ability was uh, in her success. Um, what set John apart uh, is the, his ability to communicate with theorists and lead them to achieve what no one person can achieve alone. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the PRISM Center is a great example of this, uh, where he, he has uh, um, about 11 people uh, in, the, uh, in the program uh, as a PI, uh, herding the cats to um, develop this uh, um, big suite of uh, software that, are, uh, that, are, uh, uh, that enables ICME uh, in uh, lightweight materials. Um, I remember uh, the old time when uh, um, uh, there was much skepticism in uh, the feasibility of ICME. Um, there was actually a, a quite a bit of tension between the um, a scientist and engineering at that time, uh, what that ICME would mean to the, uh, the future of science. And uh, um, some called him a dreamer, to which he uh, responded, I'm a visionary. <laughs> and visionary he is. Uh, and today, uh, no one does the feasibility of ICME. Uh, and it's a very established subdiscipline of material science engineering that he founded, or at least co founded. Uh, it's my pleasure to bring uh, John uh, Allison to the, uh, to the podium. <laughs> I think, thank you for that kind introduction. <laughs> I never said I was a visionary. <laughs> TMS put it in a letter that I had my signature to that I didn't get to proofread. <laughs> so thank you for that kind introduction and thank you Rachel and Amit and the organizers for putting this symposium together and inviting me. Um, and thank you all for taking time out of your day to uh, hear what I have to say about I See Me and sort of the subtitle is that uh, I think, so we teed this off uh, yesterday with uh, Sharon's talk on materials genome initiative. And so I think it's uh, uh, appropriate to end with that note, uh, at least for the, the uh, faculty presentations. Um, and uh, what I'd like to say is that this is an essential ingredient of MGI. So this is a way to um, uh, reap the rewards of all the uh, effort and uh, resources that are being expended on MGI. So many of us sit over here, we dream up new concepts uh, that we'd like to get into uh, production, and then we see this valley of death, the materials technology valley of death. Well, over here we've got materials engineers or aerospace engineers or automotive engineers who equally have dreams of new uh, components or new applications, and so we need a way to bridge this valley of death. And so I think ICME uh, purports to do that, and I'll talk about uh, how we do that. Uh, so um, I've sort of divided this talk into sort of three chapters, if you will, this story. I want to talk a little bit about ICME, an overview, uh, and then a little bit about how we're implementing lift, uh, ICME into the lift uh, culture and technology. Talk a, quite a bit about sort of next generation ICME. So this is all about sort of current uh, state for ICME. Uh, but the PRISM Center where we're doing multi-scale, uh, integrated multi-scale modeling, I view as next generation ICME, so I'll talk a fair amount about that. And then finally, hopefully I have time so it took a fair amount of my time here, so I'm watching my clock. Um, so if you'd give me, maybe when I've got five minutes, Katsu, uh, I'll know. Uh, at any rate, um, so whether you're interested in ICME metals or what have you, uh, one of the things I hope you come away with interested in is the materials commons, because that is pervasive for all material systems, uh, all sorts of applications, and so I want to spend a little time at the end talking about that. Okay, so if you are a metallurgist, you know about this curve, the age hardening curve. If you've taught uh, MSC 220 or 250, you know about it. Uh, so hardness versus aging time. So we see this uh, peak aging phenomena, overaging, et cetera. Very well, very important strengthening mechanism in metals. Uh, so we have this uh, curve here, aluminum copper. And then we add various alloying elements. This curve here, we added same 
amount of copper, we added 0.3 magnesium, 0.4 silver, and one lithium. So what's interesting about those uh, curves is that this was the engine block in the Wright Brothers uh, uh, flyer, the Wright flyer in 1906. Uh, this is the wing, uh, wing uh, uh, structure of the 777 in 1989. Um, and so it took us 80 years to add 0.3 magnesium, 0.4 silver, and one lithium. We have got to do better than that. Right, so classic thing is it takes 10 to 20 years to develop a new material. The global competitiveness, global warming, et cetera, societal needs really means that we're not doing our job. We really have to get better at this. And so along comes the Materials Genome Initiative <clears throat> that has exactly that uh, uh, idea in mind to uh, accelerate the pace of um, development of new materials, discovery and development, and the fraction, at a fraction of the cost. And that's done by linking uh, tightly uh, theory, simulation, and experiment, uh, computational tools, experimental tools, and digital data. Um, and so the story goes that there are two communities that hate this, the title Materials Genome Initiative, the biologist and the materials community, but <laughs> we had, that had to sell this to a president, and so this became the way to capture the imagination. And I think it does that very, very well. Uh, but in this context, MGI, or the, the materials genome, uh, connotes a fundamental building block towards a larger purpose. And so that's what uh, we also look at with ICME. Well, one of the precursors of MGI was this National Academies uh, study that Katsuo mentioned uh, that uh, uh, Teresa Pollack uh, chaired and I uh, was the vice chair and we had a group of about uh, 12 uh, other individuals that studied this for about 18 uh, months and issued this uh, report in 2008, ICME, a transformational discipline for improved competitiveness and national security. Um, one, the vision that this uh, group came up with uh, was that computationally driven materials development would be a core activity of our profession, uh, uniting materials science with materials engineering and integrating materials more holistically and computationally with product development. So I wanna highlight a couple of things. Uniting materials science with materials engineering. Our field is really pretty disparate when we talk about engineering versus science. And so ICME is a way for us to link those tightly, more tightly together. Uh, also integrating materials more host holistically and, and computationally with product development. The product development community is going like light speed, developing new products rapidly, rapidly, rapidly. And because materials uh, engineering is not computationally uh, proficient, uh, we're sort of out of that loop. And so the important thing is to drive us back into that loop uh, so that we are helping drive new products with new materials. Okay, so what is ICME? Uh, the integration, so this uh, uh, report ad identified that or defined that as the integration of materials information captured in computational tools uh, with engineering product performance analysis and manufacturing process simulation. So as Katsuo said, um, I'm an experimentalist, full disclosure. So this materials information may come from experiments, but to make it into the ICME uh, culture, it has to be captured in computational tools. So that's why I had to learn how to communicate with computational folks, so they could capture uh, the insights that we had experimentally. Um, so a way to look at this, so we, uh, prior to ICME, we have these great computational uh, tools for manufacturing simulation. We have great uh, product performance analysis tools, fine and element based typically, uh, for doing durability, crash, et cetera. But we have a missing link here, which is our field, quantitative processing structure property relationships. Um, and so in order, so we all know that the properties are very sensitive to manufacturing processes, local, uh, have local um, uh, variability. Uh, very locally uh, throughout the part, uh, uh, and uh, we, but we don't have a good way to represent that in the final product performance analysis. So ICME purports to take manufacturing simulation, 
then couple that with quantitative processing structure property relationships to get uh, manufacturing sensitive uh, properties into the final engineering product performance analysis. And if we do that uh, well, then we can do rapid process and product optimization. This is the way we use this at Ford, uh, to do rapidly over and over and over again, uh, uh, dozens and dozens of uh, components uh, of, a, of a few uh, simple alloys. Uh, uh, or we can drive it backwards uh, to define new alloys and new manufacturing processes. And this is sort of the uh, holy grail for, for many of us. So just uh, graphically, we might look at a cylinder head and, uh, for a, a, a cast aluminum cylinder head. So we would have a traditional manufacturing simulation that would predict thermal history. Uh, from that, we would predict local microstructure. From that, predict local properties. And from that, those local manufacturing history sensitive properties would go into product performance analysis. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, what ICME uh, is. So at Ford, when we started this back in the late, uh, mid to late 90s, uh, we started thinking about what, for aluminum castings, what were the critical properties? So the critical properties for uh, powertrain castings uh, are high cycle fatigue, low cycle fatigue, yield strength, and something called thermal growth, a swelling that comes from uh, uh, overaging. Um, the critical microstructures were microporosity, uh, eutectic phases, precipitate structures, and those were affected from the manufacturing process by the casting and the heat treat process. So uh, many of these, and when we developed this uh, Ford virtual aluminum castings, were individual PhDs uh, out here, our master's uh, projects here or, or at Ohio State or very, University of Illinois, various other universities, Tsinghua University in China. Um, and so as a community, we tend to fall into these little boxes. The power of ICME and the important thing about ICME is figuring out the linkages between the little boxes. Uh, and that's so very, very important. And so it's a very, that's why ICME is very much a collaborative uh, team sport, if you will. Um, I liken it to, you know, it, we have virtuoso musicians in all of our fields. We rarely get to operate as an orchestra. And so ICME provides us a way to operate as a, as a fine-tuned orchestra. Uh, the other thing that it provides, so anytime we're engineering a component, we have, uh, we can't maximize each of these properties. We have to get a balance. And so we have to do that. Historically, we just did that uh, sort of Edisonian uh, by building it and busting it. But ICME provides us a way to conduct quantitative engineering trade-offs. And so this is another part of the value of ICME. Well, it's a very hard problem. Uh, because as we all know, we have to think about microstructures at all scales, how those microstructures at all scales affect properties differently, different properties, different ways. And of course, all of these levels are affected by manufacturing history, but they're affected by manufacturing history in different ways and, and affect properties in different ways. And so there's no single mechanism or relationship that helps uh, describe all of these phenomena. That's one of the things that makes our field so interesting. It's also one of the reasons it's so complicated and why many people thought that this would be impossible to capture this and uh, put it into some sort of a computa integrated computational tool. I don't have time to go through a lot of the, the interesting uh, science we did at, at Ford to do this. and. Uh, uh, it's old enough that it would be probably inappropriate to do so. But at any rate, uh, I wanted to give you uh, one snapshot of one tool we developed, which is the uh, virtual aluminum castings local fatigue strength. So we had to, again, do uh, conventional uh, uh, filling solidification uh, analysis, uh, local thermal history analysis. From that, we predicted local microstructure, and a critical part of this was local porosity. And from that, we got poor size distributions, I mean, uh, poor size distributions uh, throughout the part. And from that, we got, using a small crack fracture mechanics model, local fatigue strength throughout that part. Well, uh, so, with it, ICME, uh, we develop physics-based models relationships wherever they're available, but they're not always available. We have to do these things for ICME for industry fairly quickly. 
Uh, so we tend to use a lot of imperial constants and adjustable parameters, and we certainly did it forward big time. And that means there's an importance of validation of these uh, models um, at the end. It's a very, very critical step. Uh, but the important thing is not that we uh, get the problem solved 100%. So for the, th the fundamental uh, folks, this is sometimes a difficult thing to accept. All we really need is a sufficient accuracy to allow decision making. So that's the importance of ICME is on the decision making side. So for example, uh, here was a, uh, an aluminum casting uh, that Ford used in the 2.5 liter uh, V6 Duratec engine. Uh, we were, uh, it was, had been low pressure casting for quite some time. Uh, and it was well known that low pressure casting was absolutely the best casting processes process for um, uh, cylinder heads. A uh, supplier came along and said, well, we can save you $10 per part for that using gravity casting. Well, historically, we would have just said, thank you very much. We don't have time uh, to, to, to uh, or the resources to really accomplish that. That would have taken us three years to go from here to here. And so even to send, save $10 a part, which is a big number in the auto industry, as Alan pointed out, um, um, we probably, we just wouldn't have done it because we would have had to do tooling, we would have had to do 30 engine tests, everything to validate this. But we had virtual aluminum castings. So we could very quickly um, analyze that part and we determined the critical region, the fatigue properties are actually better. So that we had a, a almost a 50% increase in fatigue properties going from low pressure to gravity casting. Now we never would have been able to measure that because these are very fine, well we could have in the limit, but uh, these are very, uh, uh, these are about four millimeter sections so it'd be very difficult to get samples. Uh, so the only way really to do that, to determine this is either modeling or an engine test. So we did this with modeling. Uh, by now we'd done enough validation that the product development community said, we believe this, let's go launch the tooling. So within um, nine months, we had gotten new tooling and they, they accepted maybe three or four engine tests instead of 30 uh, to go from here to here. So we accelerated the uh, production introduction by 30 months. We also reduced costs by $10 per cylinder head. Well, that doesn't sound like a lot, right? But it's a huge number. So there's two of these per engine. This is one of the large, highest uh, production engines that Ford makes, so about half a million at that time. So that's about, what's that? 10 million a year, dollars. Um, and over the last 12 years, that saved Ford, with that single uh, change alone, about $100 million. So that's the power of ICME. Okay, so, um, uh, the, uh, uh, this National Academy study looked at the Ford study, looked at GE, looked at a number of different places and concluded that uh, uh, ICME does have great promise uh, with returns on investment of three to one to nine to one. Typical investments are a little bigger than a typical uh, grad student project, five to $20 million range. Um, so, uh, just a couple things. ICME provides a means to link science and engineering, manufacturing materials and design, experiments, theory and simulation, and information across disciplines. Uh, this uh, panel said there were a number of requirements for ICME success. First, we had to achieve its transformational benefits. It had to be embraced by the materials community and this required broader participation. Uh, industry acceptance of ICME is slow because a lot of the computational tools are uh, science-based uh, and they haven't transitioned to engineering tools and there's a scarcity of people that are trained to use them. Development of ICME requires cross-functional teams uh, uh, focused on what we call foundational engineering problems and U.S. In industry should identify important uh, foundational engineering problems and establish consortia to implement them. Uh, so then along comes LIFT, and we try to implement all of these uh, recommendations. So LIFT, as Alan said, is this new Metals Manufacturing Innovation Institute uh, led by Michigan, Ohio State, and Edison Welding Institute. We have over 100 member companies, and ICME is a key technology focus for LIFT. So here's some examples of LIFT projects that are going on that are, have high ICME content. 
Uh, there's a thin wall ferrous casting, thin wall aluminum die casting, uh, thermal mechanical processing for titanium, which is basically linear friction welding, uh, uh, aluminum forging, uh, uh, thermal mechanical processing, and then an interesting new uh, one is uh, uh, manufacturing process optimization, basically for corrosion of aluminum alloys. So we've got a number of projects going on. On the ICME side, our goal is to take all of these projects and try to weave these into a tapestry uh, in which we have sort of systematic ways of characterizing and modeling materials. Uh, we retain the information uh, uh, in a standardized way, and this will be part of what, when I'm talking about the materials commons, we fill that here. We focused on validation and uncertainty, so this allows us to understand uh, what our uh, degree of uncertainty is for when we're making uh, decisions. Uh, an important part will be industry-ready software, so it's taking all of the information from these projects and uh, giving that to industry in a, uh, in a way that they can readily use. Uh, and then finally, workforce development. What shake is it? Are we having an earthquake? <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Um, at any rate, and then an, an important part of this also is workforce development. Um, and so uh, Chal Park is helping me with a lot of these things. Okay, so that's sort of general ICME and sort of current state. Now what I wanted to switch gears uh, uh, with and talk about the PRISM Center, uh, our attempt to uh, develop next gen generation ICME. And so here's again our ICME flow. The idea is that we don't have a standardized way to do this central core. And uh, we, uh, uh, at least for um, metals, we hope to uh, have prisms as an extensible scientific core so we can rapidly insert science into the engineering uh, process. So as Katso said, it's a fairly large team. This is all funded by a Department of Energy, uh, Basic Energy Science, and uh, uh, is uh, uh, one of their key software innovation uh, centers uh, for MGI. Uh, so many of the uh, faces that you will recognize here. We also have uh, professional staff because if we're developing software for, and uh, uh, repository for folks to use, it became clear that it was important that this be really uh, high quality software. So these folks are either developing the software or they're guiding the students and postdocs in the development of the uh, tools. And again, a fairly large team, and so I acknowledge uh, the activity, the efforts of many, many students, postdocs, and faculty and staff. So we have uh, three primary thrusts. Uh, the computational tools I mentioned, materials commons I'll talk about, and then the integration of science. So this is where the experimentalists and the theorists uh, meet. Uh, and basically, our goal is to establish a unique scientific uh, platform that will enable uh, accelerated uh, predictive material science. So this is uh, our wiring diagram, if you will, our framework. Uh, we start off here with, at the atomistic level, going to the mesoscale, microstructure prediction, then to the mechanical behavior side. Uh, uh, the white boxes are our uh, codes that we're developing, so uh, statistical mechanics, uh, density functional, real space DFT, uh, phase field, and crystal plasticity and continuum plasticity. Uh, these are integrated with existing codes, so VASP for doing ground state DFT, Paradis for doing dislocation uh, phenomena, and then LAMPS, we've recently with Liang Chi added uh, molecular dynamics. Experiments are obviously critical to this whole venture to define mechanisms um, and critical events and then uh, uh, do the validation. So we have uh, insertion points for experiments. And then finally, the materials commons, all of the information flows into the materials commons so it can be made available. So here's our PRISM's open source uh, software, which is sort of the core. It, these are all modular, integrated, but modular so they can be used individually. Uh, or they can be used uh, uh, in concert. Uh, the focus is, again, these are all open source tools, so we look for open source community development, integrated hierarchical multi-scale. These are all scalable and uh, uh, massively parallel, so we've really focused a great deal on uh, computational efficiency. 
So here are our tools. They've, these have been um, out since uh, all, these four, the integration tools, statistical mechanics, phase field, and crystal plasticity and continuum plasticity have been out for two years. We update those annually. And so the last update was August of 2017. And recently we introduced a new uh, real space D of T tool um, in August 2017. So these all ha are available on GitHub, uh, a lot of documentation, uh, user manuals, formulation tests, et cetera. Um, and this is sort of the take rate, if you will, uh, for the PRISMS tools since, uh, since we started counting um, in uh, January of 2016. So now we have about 600 uh, unique clones of these uh, computation tools around the globe and pretty much equally distributed between phase field, plasticity, and the statistical mechanics tools. And if you're not using them and they're interested, hopefully you will uh, uh, use them soon. I want to talk a bit about the science side. Um, so this again is where we uh, link experiments and simulation. Uh, and we chose to look at magnesium alloy development. Uh, it's a fairly immature uh, alloy system. Uh, uh, and there are uh, certainly, as Alan mentioned, light waiting for whether it's automotive or aerospace. There's a lot of interest in magnesium, but there's a lot of property needs uh, for magnesium. And so this seemed like a, a good demonstration for the PRISMS uh, framework. Uh, we, we do this by uh, studying what we call use cases, by collaborating in use cases. And we have a precipitate use case, a tensile use case, and a fatigue use case. So the idea is, well, typically if I'm studying precipitate evolution, I might study precipitate evolution. Here I have a way now to predict the effect of precipitates on strength or the effect of precipitates on fatigue, et cetera, and other mechanisms. Uh, so we operate uh, in these use groups. So now to again back to our wiring diagram, I want to just take you very quickly through a couple of uh, use cases. So the precipitate use group, we couple DFT, ground state DFT uh, to uh, statistical mechanics using Anton van der Veen's uh, CASM, cluster approach to statistical mechanics. Then use our new PRISM's phase field code to do precipitate evolution. All of this is coupled with experiments uh, to do uh, quantitative uh, TEM. <clears throat> so uh, just one slide on that. We have, we've focused a lot on mag rare earth alloys because these really are have the highest strength capability of any magnesium alloy, um, uh, alloy system. Um, and so predicting, and, and all of the precipitates that are important are metastable, so we can't find those in the typical phase diagram. Um, so um, Ellen uh, Solomon in the Marquis Group has, has done an incredible job um, um, measuring uh, new, identifying new precipitate structures and uh, 3D morphologies. Um, and we uh, so uh, discovered basically, so there's about a 20 year uh, controversy about what's going on in these alloys. Uh, and now we've, using this in this precipitate use group, really nailed uh, this uh, conclusively. Uh, so you see these, uh, these really interesting zigzags and hexagonal rows. Well, it turns out uh, this is really a continuous um, um, ensemble of, uh, of hierarchical phases that we've now called beta triple prime. Um, and Anton's student Anarud has uh, shown conclusively that that is uh, a, only in certain rare earth alloys. And we use magneodymium as our uh, prototypical um, uh, system, but it can also be found in other mag rare earths. On the other hand, in the magitrium system, we have another phase called beta prime S. Um, and so this, this uh, follows quite different uh, phase diagram and a more traditional one where we have basically a single phase beta prime S and as a metastable. Um, Anton's uh, student Anarud also uh, calculated the stress-free transformation strain. We used the, the, the uh, thermodynamics and stress-free transformation strain to uh, in PRISM's phase field to predict uh, the unique morphologies of these alloys. And we found these lenticular phases were predicted uh, for the, the magneodymium uh, type alloys and these uh, needle type phases 
were predicted for the magitrium, which is what we observed. And so now we have a tool, uh, we're doing the kinetics now uh, for predicting that. And so this is, and we have a series of papers that I'm sure will be landmarks in this area. Uh, so that's the precipitate use case. Now we pass this off to uh, do dislocation dynamic calculation. Uh, and then that uh, feeds into our tensile use case where we uh, use uh, DFT uh, or uh, uh, real space DFT to look at the pyrals effects, dislocation dynamics to look at the uh, uh, interaction with precipitates, then hand that off to crystal plasticity to look at grain size texture effects. And again, with critical experiments and putting in the materials commons. So we have not yet made the transition to do the uh, uh, Paradis calculations, dislocation dynamics from the phase field. That's just about to start. But we did some early work. Larry Adjison, who was on our staff, did some early work using Paradis to do dislocation interactions. Uh, and so we uh, uh, have a lot of confidence now that this approach will give us quantitative information for looking at age hardening effects once we know the, the correct morphology from phase field. We take that information and plug that into the crystal plasticity uh, code. So conventionally these uh, parameters here would be inverse modeled uh, and, the, and we certainly are doing that. But now we have the capability to go through from first principles to uh, calculate these parameters um, uh, using our uh, DFT and dislocation dynamic simulations and other calculations. And so um, um, Alan talked about uh, how in, within Lyft we're interested in texture development. This tool does an, uh, an excellent job, and this is uh, from the Sundaragaman group in Aero, of capturing uh, crystal plasticity, uh, capturing texture evolution uh, uh, during the manufacturing process and then uh, using that uh, to predict uh, accurately the stress strain response. Um, well, we also are doing work in fatigue. I don't have time to really talk about everything that we're doing there. We're doing a lot of work in fatigue crack growth and cyclic uh, low cycle fatigue. But I did want to tease you with one uh, recent um, experimental result that we've had, for an analytical result. Um, so this is uh, the work of Ariel Murphy. Uh, and uh, she went to Chess, uh, Cornell, uh, high energy X-ray diffraction uh, facility last year. And uh, so uh, this is looking at magnesium extrusions and they tend to have a basal texture. And so uh, when you uh, shine these uh, high energy X-rays through it, you get these uh, peaks here from that texture. Uh, and then there's an absence of texture here. When you push these in compression as you do in cyclic stress strain, uh, you generate twins. Those twins have 90 degree um, uh, rotations locally. And so now we start to see a peak here. So as we're straining this, tension and compression, as Ariel did at Chess, you can see the intensity of this peak. First, there's no intensity up here. Then this peak raises and lowers right here. And so we can see that as a function of cyclic deformation. So during the first cycle, uh, there's no twinning. Then we have twinning during compression. Then we, as we reverse, we start to pick up detwinning. These are these are analytic or these are uh, uh, experimental results from Ariel's work at Chess. Then uh, exhaustion of detwinning. Well, we are right, we have this crystal plasticity model that Vera has developed, and so uh, he's now uh, included back stress and twinning, and so we can look at the cyclic stress strain response. And so this is very important for the low cycle fatigue phenomenon. And we have a technique now for measuring dislocation or, or damage, if you will, from this twinning, detwinning, because this changes also uh, with a uh, number of cycles. OK. So that's kind of very quick snapshot of sort of the integrated multiscale um, activities within uh, prisms. Last thing I wanted to talk about uh, was the materials commons, which is the third element of our uh, uh, prisms thing. And this is where we uh, uh, basically incorporate uh, or make, it's a repository and collaboration platform uh, basically for the community. And our focus really is on seamless and continuous part of the workflow, trying to make this easy to get information into the materials commons. 
and capture provenance along the way. So we all use Dropbox, right? Well, Dropbox, the problem is you have no provenance. You really don't know exactly what's there with the, with the information. And so we're trying to automatically uh, track the provenance of both experiments and simulation. The problem we're trying to solve is this. So it's a very common problem in material science or any physical science. I'd like to find, understand, and use data, including my own data, right? Allen's student graduates, where's the data, right? So you got, we need a way to go back and capture that data, and it could be our own, our own students, what have you, or others. Um, I'd like to share my information with others, but that's really a difficult process. I'd like to collaborate with others, but there's no easy way to do that. And so this is what we're trying to do with Materials Commons. This basically, it's part of the MGI strategic plan, but it actually dates back to our ICME study which said to fully reach its per, uh, potential, ICME requires new advances in networking, computing, and software, and so it's focused here on this curated repositories for data and materials models and simulation tools. So it can be the results of a PRISMS tool, it can be an experiment uh, from uh, your lab, uh, but it can go into the materials commons. Here's our splash, our, our entry play, so Go to this, uh, this uh, website, create an account. You can get in very uh, easily. Uh, the approach that we're taking uh, to make this as seamless as possible uh, is sort of an electronic lab notebook. So you have a lot of information that you might want to put uh, for uh, who's funding it, who your collaborators are, just notes about things. But then the, the th th crux of it is establishing our workflow. So we create a sample. We might, uh, this one researcher might do EVSD, another might do heat treatment and ultrasonic fatigue. So it's trying to capture this information sort of holistically. Uh, this was released last year um, in August. Um, and with this, because we're, we're so focused on um, uh, workflow, we have monthly releases on this because we're constantly improving this. Uh, so if you've been in there a year ago, come again and, and, and see what's changed. Right now we have 180 registered users. We've got about a million files uploaded. 150 s data sets have been uploaded. Um, and we have about 400 terabytes of storage available. We used a fraction of that uh, so far. We have a project or a collaboration site. And if you're not in PRISMS, we ask that you use that for a minute for no more than about three or four months, in which case then the data should be made public. Uh, but we can always, uh, discuss that and, and negotiate that, and uh, we're, we're constantly looking for ways to instantiate this uh, in a way that uh, doesn't um, sort of uh, cause us problems with our 400 terabytes of storage. We have also uh, have a separate secure site for Lyft members where we're doing, putting the Lyft uh, proprietary uh, information, and it can be made public uh, when it's chosen to do it using the normal ways. Um, an important thing that we've discovered is for this entire information infrastructure uh, situation is that no single solution is going to solve the problem. And so we have a number of people uh, working to confederate uh, different solutions. Uh, so we're working very closely with NIST, uh, something called the Mater Materials Data Facility out of uh, uh, University of Chicago and University of Illinois, Citrine, which is a commercial startup uh, uh, for doing data mining, et cetera. And so we're all working together to make sure the data is uh, uh, registered, uh, 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 able to be mined. So we're not working on data mining tools, but Citrine and the materials data facility are. And so we're making our data available to them so they can use advanced learning uh, uh, algorithms to uh, find correlations in data. Okay, so the last point uh, about the PRISM Center is it's very much a collaborative community. Uh, so whether it's uh, open source codes, using the materials commons, or uh, our science, uh, building that community is very, very important for us. Um, and uh, so we have an annual workshop. The next one, the last one was last August. The next one is next August. Uh, and so we have uh, three days of training on the tools and then two days of technical exchange. So uh, you can go here and, um, and l leave us a note here that you'd like to be informed for next year. 
Okay, so I think I see me, uh, this is future I see me with the prisms, but uh, past and, and future I see me are helping us bridge this materials technology valley of death. And that's done by linking science and engineering, um, manufacturing materials and product development, and information across knowledge domains. Uh, ICME is an essential ingredient of MGI and is providing a direct and continuing payoff to industry and government for uh, the resources expended on MGI. Uh, and the PRISM Center and LIFT ICME are designed to help the material science and the engineering community move quickly into this ICME MGI era. So with that, I thank you for your attention.